Welcome back one and all to another episode here at the Damage Report. Big old Tuesday show coming at you with me, Johnny Rolla, and very lucky to have as our guest today, Waz de Lombre himself. Wozni, how's it going? I'm good, very, very blessed to be back. Uh, we're blessed to have you. Um, everyone watching this is familiar with Wazi, I'm sure. But if you don't know, he does a lot, both writing and hosting in his own right. Uh, I hear you've got an episode of your show coming out just later today. Yeah, 5.30 PM Pacific Standard Time, uh, live on Twitch. We'll be doing another episode of Wozniak. Everybody come tune into that, we're gonna have some fun. That sounds awesome. Uh, are we gonna have fun today on the damage report? You know what? <laughs> I think that we might actually, cuz we've, look, the, the, the theme of the, the week so far is nonsense. But mostly it's really frustrating nonsense, like make you nauseous nonsense. Nausea sense, um, but today we've got a little bit of fun nonsense. Um, more book revelations from people that used to like Trump and now hate him or whatever. Um, so we're gonna have fun little tidbits about uh, different aspects of his presidency. And then unfortunately we do have to jump back into the infrastructure discussion because um, our joint presidents, uh, Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, um, they they don't they still are mad and don't want to give us the infrastructure bill that uh, that we've been promised. So we're gonna give you updates on that. Updates on the incredibly uh, uh, obvious corruption. Uh, Megan McCain has started her career as a new freelance political commentator, so that should be fun. And then we've got updates on R. Kelly and Chris Cuomo and a whole bunch of stuff. So it's gonna be fun. Uh, and as we go through this, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, sharing the stream, that would be great. And uh, if you wanna send us any comments, sweet super chats, all that, we'll res uh, read and respond to those as we go. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you an update. I'm obviously still sick, apologies for that. Thank you for bearing with us, my voice is what it is. Uh, but that said, uh, Waz, you ready to jump into some news? Yes sir, let's do it. Okay, let's do it, let's do it while I still have the voice to do it with. Former uh, White House Press Secretary and aide to the First Lady Melania Trump, Stephanie Grisham's book, I'll Take Your Questions Now is coming out soon. When? I don't know and I don't care. I'm actively not interested in when it is because you shouldn't buy it. She's a former Trump toady and all that, trying to cash in on what she knows rather than revealing it to the American people when it would have really mattered. But that said, there is some interesting stuff that's being revealed in the run up to the book being released. And you've probably seen a lot of headlines going around. So we're gonna touch base on a bunch of them. And they really do span the gamut from potentially important international news to very much behind the scenes looks into Trump's psychology and how he managed certain crises and all that. The first though is the one that I think is generating the most headlines and that has to do with a 2019 G20 summit in Osaka, Japan. So Grisham said she saw Trump lean towards Putin, Vladimir Putin, you know, head of Russia, and tell him, "quote Okay, I'm going to act a little tougher with you for a few minutes, but it's for the cameras, and after they leave, we'll talk. You understand." He later on said, "Don't meddle in the election, President." Waddling, waddling his figure or wagging his figure. Now that's a weird Freudian slip. At Putin, when an interpreter translated Trump's request, Putin laughs, according to Stephen Grisham. So. That's like the that's the big one, Wazi, that everyone's talking about. <laughs> and I get it. Obviously, we've got a lot of baked in thoughts about Trump and Putin. But that said, like, I don't know. Feel free to disagree. I actively want you to. I don't know. It feels like it feels like joking around. Like they're they're with other yeah. people. Is he really gonna reveal anything like super like revealing about what he's actually thinking? Like I feel like he's joking around. Yeah, I feel like four and a half years after Trump was elected and sworn in as you know president of the United States, we're now at the stage where we are scraping the bottom of the barrel for Trump nuggets and tidbits for these books. This is like the 400th book that's mm -hmm. come out of Trump <laughs> world. And apparently publishers are more than happy to keep putting these things out, I guess they're Still an appetite for it. This conversation or alleged convo that he had with Putin at the G20, you know, that tracks with kind of everything that we've already learned about their relationship. And, you know, you can say what you want about whatever he might have said to this guy at these world leader summits. They levied some pretty punitive Russian sanctions under his administration. Like, that's just a fact mm -hmm. of, um, 
what happened. So like these little nuggets, I guess, should get people riled up. But like there was, you know, tangible stuff was done to the Russians in, you know, in response to what they may or may not have done during the 2016 elections. Yeah. If you want to be angry about their weird relationship, um I don't like there's more than enough stuff when they were doing the press conference. <laughs> like I don't think you need to go <laughs> behind the scenes to find it. That said, look, the the reason I I want to talk about this is I do want to understand as much as I can about the world. It's destroying my sanity and making me hate my fellow man, but that's like my predilection is curiosity. But you got you got to bring something good. Now I do think that there's some more interesting stuff. I just wanted to acknowledge this is the one that's generating the headlines, and I get why. I would have predicted that it would too. It just it doesn't titillate me. Uh, but that said, maybe this will for you. So um, you uh, you probably remember uh, Trump took like a previously undisclosed sort of secret trip to Walter Reed Hospital, not when he got COVID. This is back in 2019, and we've been wondering. Why? Like there, remember there were there was that that news cycle about micro was it micro seizures or micro strokes? Mostly because he came out of the blue without seemingly any reason to, and claimed that he had not had a series of micro strokes. And it's like, wait, I, why are you talking about micro strokes? Anyway, apparently that's not what it was. Um, so back in 2019, he went there, and uh, there was this mystery. Grisham's book strongly hints that the president went for a simple colonoscopy without actually using the word. She describes it in a way that it likely is a colonoscopy. So why the elaborate concealing? Well, Grisham writes that Trump was resistant to having Vice President Mike Pence in power even for a short time. And he didn't want to be the butt of a joke on late night TV. And he really is setting himself up for one with that particular wording. So he didn't want you to know what the the thing that happened was because they would have joked about him. And look, let's let's be real. They would have, I would have definitely. Um, and he didn't want to be put under because if as president you go under, the vice president uh, assumes control during that time. And he didn't want him to do that. But like, dude, you picked Pence. He's the guy you picked. So I don't know, what do you think about this as an explanation for all of that? I buy it actually. Uh, one because the whole colonoscopy and you know dudes get so ridiculous when it comes to that procedure and yeah. talking about it and getting it done and pretending that it's the end of the world that anybody would have to have one done. Like I buy that because that's just something that you see every day amongst the men in your life. Uh, yeah. But two, I just love the idea that he just didn't want Mike Pence tasting power even yeah. for a second. <laughs> he didn't want him getting a, a sniff of power. I, I just love that about it. It's just like, nope, Mike Pence, I don't care mm -hmm. what it takes. We're not letting Mike Pence near the wheels of power. We don't want him getting any bright ideas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and I wonder which bothers him more. Like that Pence would briefly be in charge. And what is Pence gonna do? <laughs> Pence doesn't, he doesn't have any goals or anything. Um, is he more mad about the wonder though? Um, but in any event, uh, Grisham writes that it was an opportunity, which I guess it was for Trump to use the power of his office to demystify colonoscopies to fight back against some of the stigma that Waz is talking about there. But she writes, as with COVID, he was too wrapped up in his own ego and his own delusions about his invincibility. Yeah, it's like it, it, it is a standard thing that happens when you get to a certain age. But he's like, if the guy can't wear a mask in public, there ain't no way he's talking about a colonoscopy. So that's pretty clear, I think. Yeah, anyway. when, is, when is Trump? Use the power of his office for anything other than personal gain, right? Personal vanity. Like it, he used that office was all about him. Uh, this mm. is in line with everything that he did for four years. It was like, all right, how do I enrich myself? How do I make myself look tougher, grand, more grandiose, make myself seem like a bigger deal? Like that's, it was all about his own vanity and personal enrichment. So again, like the idea that he didn't think, you know, publicly coming out as somebody who had a colonoscopy done would make him look sufficiently cool enough. Uh, again, this is consistent <laughs> yeah. with everything he did while he was in office. So I don't think yeah. anybody should be surprised. And I also have no reason to not believe uh, any of the sort of the details of Grisham's book. Yeah, and, and I'll add, 
I don't even necessarily begrudge him it. Like, yes, it would have been good to use the power of your office for that. And presidents do versions of it. Like Biden got his booster shot on camera yesterday, but Biden didn't get a colonoscopy on camera yesterday, and I don't know that he would. <laughs> like, so look, I'm I pledged years ago that I would never be fair to Donald Trump, but I sort of get this one to some extent. Just don't make it worse by bringing up microstrokes for some reason. Anyway, there is some stuff that gets um, a little bit darker. So Grisham alleges that Trump at one point became obsessed with a young female press aide who isn't named in the book. The president constantly asked where the aide was during press events and allegedly once requested that she be brought to his cabin on Air Force One so he could look at her. And they used the word behind, but I don't think he used the word behind. We can speculate about what word he used. Um, so this is getting into, no, as, as president, you should not be having young press aides brought so they could turn around and you can stare at their ass. That that seems highly, like, didn't we go through like 20 years of this with Bill Clinton? Like, this is not. What you're supposed to be doing as president. So this is where that's like, I don't think he's gonna get in trouble for this or for anything, but this is more substantive than so far the other things we've had revealed, I think. I mean, come on, John, what's the point of being the most powerful man on the planet, the leader of the free world, if you can't request for AIDS to come to your sanctuary on Air Force One to just, just get a peek, just a, just oh a quick God. glance at the, at the arse, John. Come on, everybody knows that's the point of being president and not like, you know, materially changing the lives of normal <laughs> working people and like, Helping people's lives improve better with stuff like healthcare and childcare, and yeah. you know, improve wages. That's not the point of being president. It's it's those small moments on Air Force One where you get to see the tightest booty of your life, John. Oh come on, God. get with the times. I am I am not voting <laughs> for Wallace for president 2024. And by the way, a weird percentage of the revelations of this book so far is very butt focused. <laughs> anyway, we do have, we do have other things, and it gets even darker. So during an Oval Office rant against E. Jean Carroll, who has accused Mr. Trump of raping her in the 1990s, Mr. Trump first insults her looks, which look he's done that publicly. He's done that to many of the women who have accused him of sexual assault and rape. Then he gazes into Mrs. Grisham's eyes and says something that unnerves her. Quote: "You just deny it. That's what you do in every situation, right, Stephanie? You just deny it." Now that that doesn't by itself prove that he is like being clear that he's lying, but we get we get the psychology, and that that is what he has done. He just denies all of this, all of this, all these dozens of women are all liars. He didn't assault them, and he wouldn't because they're not hot enough for him to have assaulted them. Is one of the arguments that he makes. So, ugh. But again. This is the sort of thing I, I think was where, so Stephanie Grisham, you you had this conversation with the president. He was like like bringing in women to look at them. He was being pretty clear to you that he's lying about his sexual assaults. And you waited years to actually reveal that to anyone. So I don't think I've given you a Nobel Prize at this point. No, I mean, she can't expect to be getting a pat on the back for this, especially like, you know, putting this out in the form of a gossipy quote unquote tell all book. But I do think it's instructive in a couple of ways in the sense that Trump's presidency revealed a decent amount of things to us. One, first and foremost, like the machinery of Government is so huge and so locked in and entrenched that a guy could literally go in there and do nothing. Just like straight up, I'm not governing, I'm not doing anything. I'm just showing up and I'm gonna pass a tax cut and basically that's it. And the, the machinery just kept going and going. Like that kind of proves something to me that like these mechanisms that we have in the federal government are so like, Unstoppable, like even a Trump, it's like Trump can't even derail it. He just show up and do nothing, and that thing just keeps on ticking. Yeah. And two, Trump's strategy of just double down every single time is the most effective media strategy in existence. Like, just yeah. straight up, no, never happened. 
double down. In fact, they're lying. In fact, not only did I not do it, these people are liars. These people are idiots. Like that strategy proved to be so effective. Like I don't know if this Grisham lady would have came out and said or anything against him that it would have worked. He would have just been like, she's lying. Never happened. Just more gaslighting, more lying. That's proven to be the most effective well, media strategy that there is. Well, and we're gonna have a bit of that specifically about this book in just a minute or two. So don't worry, he's gonna double down as you predict. Uh, I wanna quickly run through just a couple more tidbits. Um, one, this is a fun one, I guess. At one point, Grisham writes, Mr. Trump's handlers designated an unnamed White House official known as the Music Man to play him his favorite show tunes, <laughs> including Memory from Cats, to pull him from the brink of rage. The funny thing is, I have not seen Cats, I don't know that song, but even speculating about it in my mind puts me on the brink of rage. <laughs> so, you know, we each have our thing. There's certainly some songs from Glee that would pull me back from the brink of rage. So, again, I'm not going to begrudge him that. This is almost, is this humanizing, Waz? I don't know. It seems humanizing. Do you have a song that can calm you when you're in beast mode? I don't know that I do, but if I did, it wouldn't be a show tune. Mm -hmm. Um, then like show tunes just evoke images of like guys with long tuxedo jackets and top hats, like sort of dancing around and doing hands like this. It's kind of <laughs> I wouldn't have expected funny. it for him. Yeah. It's kind of funny that that's uh that's Trump's go to for uh you know getting back into the vibes. Yeah, I'm surprised. Like if I were him, you know. I think fight song would be my thing. It would call to mind the memory of beating Hillary Clinton and all that. But whatever, he likes memory from cats. Um, release the butthole cut, hashtag. Anyway, uh, so there, here's another one. Uh, Trump behaved inappropriate with Grisham too, she wrote. Once calling her for Air Force One to assure her that his penis was not small or toadstool shaped, as the porn star Stormy Daniels had alleged. In an interview, this is just the normal sort of conversation you have with your staff constantly. So we're gonna we're gonna buzz right past that. No, we're not. Are you out of your mind? Like, I don't know whether the claims that she made are true or not, but I do know that you just have to shut up about it. Don't talk about it publicly. Definitely don't bring in your female employees to reassure them that you don't have a toadstool penis. They don't need, nor do I think most of them want that reassurance. I don't know, maybe that's me speaking for women, which I should not do. Sure, but I think for, for Trump, when you've made your entire public image about a, a penis measuring contest and who's the biggest swinging penis in the room, every single time you make a public appearance, uh, of course you're gonna feel like you have to debunk this kind of thing, yeah. right? Like he he made his bones in the Republican Party, you know, little Marco Rubio, low energy Jeb. This is all like I'm more masculine, testosterone driven than these guys, yeah. and so of course it doesn't surprise again that he would make a big deal out of this. That people would think that you know he's small and impotent and and not just a manly man's man, John. Come yeah. on. <laughs> well, and look, I honestly think he's taking it all the wrong way. Like he hates the comparison to Toad, but Toad is one of the noble of all of the characters in Super Mario. Like Toad gets it done. He's got his own games. You should be embracing that. Anyway, um, by the way, he uh, he also apparently asked her then boyfriend Grisham's then boyfriend, a fellow Trump aide, if she was good in bed. Now I bring that up <laughs> as we go towards um, his response. So Mr. Trump said in a statement uh, earlier today about the book, uh, Stephanie didn't have what it takes, and that was obvious from the very beginning. That's why I only let her be press secretary for months and months and months and months, and then she stayed on to surf under my wife. No, he didn't say that. But again, you can't have people on your staff. For long periods of time and then say, I knew when I hired them, they were dumb as hell. That makes you look bad, you toadstool idiot. Anyway, he said she had become very angry and bitter after a breakup. She had big problems and we felt that she should work out those problems for herself. Now, like everyone else, she gets paid by a radical left-leaning publisher to say bad and untrue things. So here's the most messed up thing about this. It isn't that he's just denying, 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 like she said. So from what I read, allegedly, uh, that breakup was the result of that former Trump aide being abusive towards her. Mm -hmm. That is a known thing 
It's not even the only time that one of the aides he likes that's a guy was abusive towards the female aides that he doesn't like as much. But he knows that and he is saying she's very angry and bitter about it. And that's why she has big problems. The big problem wasn't the abusive boyfriend. It was that she's just emotional about it. It's so disgusting. Anyway, any final thoughts on all this? Yeah, again, this is, you know, telling aides to come to your little room to look at their behind. Uh, somebody who comes out with a book that says, you know, some pretty disparaging remarks to say, well, they were a hack. They couldn't do the job. They stunk up the joint, mm-hmm. which is why I got rid of them. Also, they're just highly emotional. She's a crazy woman. She couldn't handle a breakup. Yeah. Like, this is par for the court. It's like, it's so stereotypical as to be laughable. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we have to laugh. <coughs> and sometimes we have to cough. So I'm going to do both. Uh, We're gonna take a short break. We come back, we're gonna be talking about infrastructure, corruption, a whole bunch of nonsense after this. I think Trump Trump should have gone in that direction. (laughs) Don't toad shame. Anyway, uh, if you don't listen to the uh, breaks, that makes no (laughs) sense to you and you're probably better off for it. Anyway, uh, with that, lots more news to get to, so why don't we jump into it? If Senator Kirsten Sinema's corruption leading up to and during this infrastructure week that we're in wasn't clear enough, she wants to make sure that you understand where her loyalties lie. She has actually scheduled a fundraiser for this afternoon, as we're filming this, Tuesday afternoon, with five different business lobbying groups, many of which fiercely oppose the reconciliation bill. Just don't call it a bribe. It's totally legal because the people taking the bribes have made it legal. Anyway, here's some more details. Under Mrs. Cinema's political logo, the Influential National Association of Wholesaler Distributors and the Grocers Pack, along with lobbyists for roofers and electrical contractors, and a small business group called the S Corp Political Action Committee, have invited association members to an undisclosed location on Tuesday afternoon for 45 minutes to write checks for between $1,000 and $5,800 payable to Cinema for Arizona. In terms of what these groups might want out of the senator, the senator that they're in the process of buying. Well, the escort pack has told its members the rate increases in the package, the reconciliation package that passed the House Ways and Means Committee quote, would kneecap private companies like theirs that pay taxes through the individual tax system, not the corporate tax system. And let's see, the chief executive for the National Association of Wholesaler Distributors said in a statement earlier this month, Quote, passing the largest tax increase in US history on the backs of America's job creators as they recover from a global pandemic is the last thing Washington should be doing. By the way, have you ever noticed that when Republicans cut taxes, it's always the largest tax cut ever. And anytime taxes are increased, it's the largest tax increase ever. Like everybody talks like Trump when they're talking about taxes. But anyway, um, for all we know was as we're having this conversation, she's receiving thousands of dollars from people that want her to kill uh, this bill or at least kill the tax increases, which she has now said she will do. What do you think we have to think about this? It's crazy that these people get to call themselves quote unquote moderates. Uh, this is an extreme view to be honest. Uh, this this bill that Biden is proposing via reconciliation has paid fors. <laughs> like it's being paid for, right? Like we're not um doing this on a credit card. And you know, I love the thing that gets on my nerves too is like when we frame it as 3.5 trillion, we always forget to add over 10 years. Yep. <laughs> like we can more than afford this. Um, and the fact that this is going to help normal working everyday Americans. And you know, basically these corporatists are gonna have their taxes increased by a little bit, which means their profit margins will decrease by a little bit. It's not like their lives are gonna be materially ruined by these tax increases, it's on the margins. And it's to pay for stuff like universal pre-K and you know the child tax credit and all of these great things that are gonna help millions of people, yep. um, their lives uh, improve like by a lot. You know, uh, the fact that Kristen Cinema gets to come out 
and basically take these legalized bribes and doesn't get publicly shamed for it. Like it's the benefit for the few at the expense of the vast majority of the population. It's ridiculous. Like this is yeah. literally what we have a federal government for. Yeah. It's to do these kinds of things like this bill and the likes of Kristen Cinema could step in front of it. It's it's maddening. Yeah, the, the fact that she she has that power and that she has that power after uh, in no way running for the seat she holds saying, oh, by the way, if there's an opportunity, I am totally gonna stand with business against all of you. All of my voters, go F yourself. I'm doing it for the people who are writing me these checks. You'd never have that. And and again, it, it's just legalized bribery. So like, does anyone think that there's not a connection between these two things? That they're giving her this money and she is delivering for exactly what they want during a time when we might get a bill or we might not. And if we get a bill, it might include some things that it might not. It's the most obvious thing in the world, but they're uh, they're 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 checks to you know like her her pack or whatever. So it's totally cool. Like think about how much news there was of Lauren Boebert like paying her rent with campaign finance stuff, like a whole cycle about it. Um, and, and I get it; it's unethical. She's being paid off right now, but she's doing it through the system that they've set up that's supposed to be okay. So it is barely mentioned. Like they do talk about it. The New York Times is covering it, mm -hmm. but it's not a news cycle of, my God, the corruption. MSNBC right. is not going to do show after show of, how can Biden possibly hope to work with someone who is so fundamentally corrupt? But should she still be in the party? These are not the conversations that they're having. Because she's going through the system that the corrupt politicians have set up. And we accept it because it's been around for a while. It's just the whole thing is disgusting. To be fair though, uh, is Joe Biden having a conversation? That's that's my problem with a lot of this. I think the collegiality of the Senate, um, it is a club, right? Like these guys do treat it like a fraternity, sorority, like it's this. You know, it's a club and they don't want to go after each other, especially members of their own party. And Biden is, you know, as reverential about the Senate as anybody else. But he should be using his bully pulpit to be like, these two idiots are standing in between meaningful change and improvement in the lives of tens of millions of Americans just so that they could receive funding from. These business interests like Biden should be coming out and using his bully pulpit as president of the freaking United States of America. Yeah. And he's not doing it, right? So we could talk about MSNBC and CNN and we don't even gotta bother with Fox News. <laughs> not yeah. doing it well, on a daily like basis, <laughs> but Biden should be doing this. 100% he should be saying, look, I ran on a clear agenda. We got control of the Senate and the House on this clear agenda. She ran on these things herself. If she wants to turn against them, that's up to her. If she wants to raise money from corporate donors, she's gonna need to because in a couple of years, we're gonna be working to replace her with someone who is not gonna try to sabotage an agenda that so many of her constituents support that she got elected for. Like imagine if you just throw, throw out a couple of those. It, it doesn't have to be a Trumpian thing. Like it doesn't have to be weird and obsessive, but he is the leader of the Democratic Party. His agenda is about to be destroyed because of her and he's acting like it's nothing. And maybe I'm an idiot, maybe I don't know anything about politics. And maybe whatever stuff he's doing behind the scenes is gonna be more effective than public threats. Maybe. But you could do both, honestly. Yeah. The whole thing, again, maybe I'm an idiot. And we get everything we want out of these bills, but it ain't really looking like it at this point. Um, that said, we uh, we got a couple more angles on this I want to talk about, including some horrible news in this whole process. But really fast, we've been, we've been criticizing uh, cinema and Mansion too. Mansion, by the way, is now even turning against the carbon tax, which is a nonsense replacement for some of the tax increases. Which now, so we, we're only going to get slight tax increases. Then we weren't going to get any tax increases, but they'll do the carbon tax. And now he's saying we're not even gonna do a carbon tax. But then you're not raising any money, so how can you pay for anything? Well, he's, he has no problem with that because he doesn't want the bill to include anything. But anyway, we have some of Representative Ilhan Omar and her thoughts on these two senators. 
It is saddening to see them use Republican talking points. We obviously didn't envision having Republicans as part of our party. Um, and I hope uh, that they will understand um, that Democrats need to be united um, behind the president's agenda. And we need to have urgent conversations on how to get this agenda done. It, like, it's just, it's so ridiculous. Like. Again, Waz was so right when he pointed out that like her being called like a centrist or a moderate. Again, I am so goddamn sick of those terms. Pretending that they're the middle point between anything. They are their own radical point, radical supporters of the status quo that benefits those who are already doing well and are already wealthy. That is what they're doing. So now you have a decidedly moderate or centrist president whose agenda is being supported by the insane left and the moderate and centrists are threatening to destroy the entire thing. So I'm glad that she's pointing that out, especially because Waz, we should we should expect that. Um, you know what, I'll, I'll throw this out here. Pelosi's now saying you're gonna have to vote on the bipartisan bill before the, the other one. So after like months and months of saying, uh, you ain't gonna get one unless you get the other. That was literally her terminology. Now she's saying you gotta vote for one without the other. So we've been waiting for this. The, the knife is in our back now, okay? It was, it's not much of a surprise. Um, and uh, she's saying that it's because, uh, well, you know, now they're saying they don't want 3.5 trillion. And that really threw things off like a week ago, but we knew that they were, they were gonna try to betray us. So Nancy Pelosi doesn't get to use their betrayal as cover uh, for her own. But in any event, now the, Demo- the the progressives, if they do what they've been saying they will do, which is vote against the bipartisan bill, if it's not passed at the same time as the reconciliation one, then do we have any doubt that the media is gonna present them as the ones that destroyed this whole thing when they've been standing with Biden the entire goddamn time? And Cinema and Manchin are the ones who have been throwing up ever shifting goalposts of how this bill can't include anything. But they're gonna they're gonna end up saying that it's Ilhan Omar and it's AOC and it's Rashida Tlaib. That's what I feel. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, one hundred percent. Because as you know, in the media, they never frame bipartisanship as, uh, you know, how about bipartisanship amongst voters? Uh, this thing, the yeah. first COVID relief bill that Biden passed had like a seventy five percent approval rating amongst voters, which means both. Republican and Democratic voters loved it. And this bill is in the high 60s as far as approval from voters of both parties. It's bipartisan, okay? Uh, Sure, the lunkhead Republican caucuses uh, aren't into it The people, as far as people who are in the federal government. But as far as voters, everyday people, both Republicans and Democrats love it, want it, think it's gonna be great. But the, you know, the corporate media will never frame it as such. If Mitch McConnell isn't on board with it, then it ain't bipartisan, which is complete and utter nonsense. Cuz we know Mitch McConnell cares about one thing and one thing only, and that is making our overlords in the oligarchy richer and richer and richer at the expense of literally every single thing else. Nothing yeah. else matters to this dude. Um, yet somehow we present his views as like uh, basically in line with some large contingent of voters, his voters don't care about that. Uh, you're 100% right. The only thing I would add is he also really likes stopping Democrats from putting people in the Supreme Court. He also <laughs> likes that <laughs> and his promise that he is going to do that again. Um, okay, so really fast, I also wanna let you know, uh, the Republicans blocked uh, a Senate bill to fund the government. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised obviously, supposedly they're gonna try again in a little bit, but yeah, we just have to keep doing this ridiculous dance around actually paying our obligations. And whoever's in charge tries to get it done and the other side tries to stop it. It's so stupid. It's one of the stupidest things about our politics. And it's a politics that is very, very stupid. But that said, I wanna move to a slightly different angle on this. So let's jump to our next block. <clears throat> so I got about 60% of my throat left. Meghan McCain is no longer on The View. She's now her own independent political commentator writing for things like uh, the Daily Mail and going on Meet the Press, which she did this weekend. And on Meet the Press, she said, the Build Back Better agenda is the most progressive modern agenda of all time, up to $5 trillion. 
which again is not even the number that's being talked about. And it's not polling well. So I think I'm just confused as to why they're doubling down on something that is cratering in the polls right now. Now bear in mind that Megan McCain referenced no polls in particular, nor was she asked to cite any by host Chuck Todd who invited her on the show. In fact, not only did they not question what she said, um, despite supposedly following the news every day and having a really good grasp of what's true and what's not. They liked that quote so much that they tweeted it out at Meet the Press. Uh, I'm not gonna read it again, but it's the full quote that we just read for you. They love that quote and they attribute it to Meghan McCain. They're so happy to have Meghan McCain on their show. The issue is that what she said isn't remotely true. There are many polls you can look at going literally months back, but we're gonna jump to one from Data for Progress showing 69% overall support uh, for the the Build Back Better plan, whatever the, the 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 reconciliation bill that includes social spending and things like that, that includes, by the way, forty percent. Uh, sorry, fifty percent of Republicans supporting it. Uh, we've got sixty five percent of uh, independent and third party uh, supporting it as well. But it's cratering in the polls. Not even not doing well, cratering in the polls, <laughs> and so. This this is a criticism that's been out there now for her nonsensical stuff for about a day. We're gonna get to her response to that, but Waz, I wanted to give you a chance to jump in. What do you think of Meghan McCain going rogue, going independent? I mean, this is par for the course on the Sunday shows. A complete hack person goes on a show hosted by Chuck Todd and is able to spew untruths and lies because that's the point of those shows, right? And it, you shouldn't be surprised that when the lies are in favor of corporate power, elite power, entrenched power, of course it gets to slide, right? When it comes to stuff that works right, that, that helps regular people, you're gonna hear Chuck Todd be like, but is it being means tested? Is it gonna be this? Is it, you, you hear all mm-hmm. of the scrutiny. When it comes to the arguments in favor of measures that help everyday (coughs) Americans. But when it comes to the ideas espoused by the elite business and corporate community, it just goes unchecked. Because on those shows, on those platforms, that's the point is to speak for entrenched power. It's not to speak for normal everyday Americans. It's to speak on behalf of the entrenched power of America. That's that's the only point of that show. And so I'm not surprised that embellishments and outright lies in support of those people's viewpoints are what gets, you know, all the runtime on Meet the Press. And yeah, and honestly, I think they must love the fact that she only exists as a political commentator because her father was in politics. Like it's totally they they love that on what well, even if they can't acknowledge it on some level they like the idea of an aristocracy mm-hmm. of America. Like just continue that family stuff. Who cares if she doesn't know anything? Who cares if like well, well you know what you can get things wrong. You you say a bunch of stuff you can get it wrong. You know I had to do. I did a survey as like a person who covers politics. I was sent this survey, which was what percentage of these different populations support X thing. And I realized as I was answering that, that I wasn't super sure about some of those. And here's the thing, I wouldn't speak about those things as if I was sure. But that said, if I said that something was cratering in the polls and I was 100% wrong or 69% wrong in this case, the next step is how do you respond to how you were wrong? Because you're gonna get things wrong as a commentator. So here's how she responds. So she is pointed out to her that she was totally wrong. It's not cratering in the polls. And she responds with this, Joe Biden is his agenda. A president's polls mean something. That's the American people aren't happy with how he's governing or his agenda. So the idea there is it doesn't matter that the policy is popular if he's not popular. Then he is his agenda, so it's cratering because he's got lower than 50% approval. So I'm trying to work through her logic here. If he's unpopular, which by her definition he is, he shouldn't try to pass popular legislation because as soon as he picks it up as his agenda, it becomes unpopular. So if he were to take something incredibly unpopular that had like 5% approval, would it suddenly get 50 or 47% approval because that's his approval rating? Like what she's saying makes no sense whatsoever when all she had to do is say, huh, you know, 
I didn't know that, I'm surprised by that result. I still don't like the bill, but I will factor that into my thinking going forward. And we got the exact opposite of that. We got this nonsensical, illogical word salad from her. Yeah, it's so funny because <laughs> in an ideal world, right? Um, a politician would be passing things that helped the most amount of people, no matter how popular or unpopular it made him, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 he wouldn't be his exist. His job wouldn't be to justify his or her own existence. It would be to help people, and so it doesn't matter. People are gonna like this. This is gonna help people's lives. My popularity should take shouldn't. Have have any bearing on what I do as far as my governance, right? That would be ideally how we do this. But you know, Megan McCain, her her whole and I think this 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 jargon is is outdated. I don't think it's as effective as it used to be when she's like, oh, he shouldn't be trying to buy up votes with this stuff. It's uh-huh. it's comical. Uh, we <laughs> we watch politicians like we just talked about with Kristen Sinema get bought. Every day, yeah. and to her, that's that's better. That's that's politics mm-hmm. working effectively. But Joe Biden tried to curry favor with actual voters, and not just these elite interests with these small amount of people. Uh, that's that's bad. You should never yeah. do that. But Kristen Cinema just being bought and paid for in this corrupt cinema. Of course, that's what you do. That's smart politics. Of course, well, look, she is going to prove what you're saying because I went on her Twitter. Don't don't do that, but I did. And uh, her, one of her most recent tweets was this: Kirsten Cinema appreciation tweet. That's all. Well, sure. I mean, this is what you should hope for as a Democratic <laughs> senator. You should hope that your state gives you an 18% approval rating, but <laughs> jo- John McCain's daughter likes you. That's what you should hope for. <laughs> and finally, she goes on to say. The bill will cost zero dollars is the most asinine talking point since I voted for it before I voted against it. The American people aren't stupid. There's nothing in this world for free, which is true. Things do cost something, which is why Meghan McCain often will criticize the debates over military budgets when they don't go into how they're gonna pay for it enough. She's very frustrated by that because of course military budgets aren't free. Have you ever have you ever heard that? Like. How are we gonna pay for this increase to the military budget? Like, never. I guess we can jack up taxes on the rich, or maybe we need a carbon tax. They've never had that conversation because wars are free in America. Bombs are free. Stuff for the middle class, the working class, that's too expensive. We can't even talk about that. Anyway, it's just nonsense. So now she's not just on the view, she's gonna be popping up all over the place. So get used to it, everybody. Any final thoughts? Yeah, and you know, to the military budget, I brought this up with with Jank yesterday. It was like when we talk about the military budget, people hear military and they think, "Be all you can be, the Marines, you know, like special forces, the SEALs, like Air Force, all these people that we love, right? Like we think they're great, some of our most competent, uh, you know, civil servants, right, if you will. But guess what? It's not them that this budget goes to. It goes yeah. to Raytheon. It goes to Dick Cheney's golfing buddies. And guess what? We don't means test it. <laughs> we don't say, yo, That's Raytheon, um, we're paying you X, Y, and Z billions of dollars for X, Y, and Z. Like, did you deliver? Are these things performing? Are they efficient? Like, can we like audit this stuff? Like, we yeah. never do that. It just goes unquestioned. But when it's like, all right, a child tax credit, it's like, hold on, man, we need to go through this thing with a fine tooth comb. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah, it 100 percent is. Um, I, I will I will close this block by just saying I am seeing a breaking news. Pramila Jayapal is saying that a majority of the Progressive Caucus is still set to vote against. The bipartisan bill on Thursday, if it's not accompanied by the reconciliation bill, we'll see. I don't take anything for granted in American politics. I would love to see it, honestly, at this point, but we will have to check out on Thursday. That said, we're going to take our second break, but stick around. We got more news coming up after this. Okay, everybody, man, this is a this is a music heavy show uh, to some extent. So why don't we jump in this last story with what remains of this hour? Big updates on the R. Kelly story. He was found guilty just yesterday of serving as the ringleader of a decades-long scheme to recruit women and underage girls for sex. 
A jury deliberated for nine hours before convicting the singer of all nine counts against him, including racketeering and eight violations of an anti-sex trafficking law known as the Mann Act. Uh, Mr. Kelly now faces the possibility of life in prison, although it will take some time to find out exactly how much time he'll be serving. We'll talk more about that uh, later on, but the reaction uh, to this development uh, came fast. Uh, Johanna Pace, uh, who was the first accuser to ever testify against him, said, today my voice was heard. I can only imagine if you've been fighting this battle publicly or privately for literally decades in some cases, how you must feel as a result of this. Another woman, Stephanie, one of the accusers, told jurors that the singer began sexually abusing her when she was 17 after he told her that he liked, quote, young girls and that he did not understand why society viewed that as a problem. That, of course, is the bare minimum of what he was doing that is viewed as a problem by society. He's focusing kind of on the wrong parts there. But in any event, we'll go into more details. Um, Waz, this has been developing like our entire lives. What do you yeah. think about this? Yeah, it's it's crazy that this guy is finally being brought to justice for a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, shouts out to all the victims and um, survivors, excuse me, who came forward and helped make this happen. Those those people are brave and you know deserve some some props for having the the sort of just the Teflon, you know, to to do that. Like they, it it takes a lot of guts to come out and publicly put your name behind an allegation like this. But the stories about R. Kelly have been out there for 30 years now, man. Like literally, the guy in the smack dab in the midst of superstardom was cruising the McDonald's next to his old high school, like after school. Those were the hours he liked to go to McDonald's to pick up young girls that were 14, 15 years old as he was a grown man and basically damn their deity in that city and in the, and in those places. Um, so that's the level of predatory behavior we're talking about here and it just gets worse and worse over the years and it sucks that so many people have enabled enabled him along the way but you know i guess it's cool to finally see him come to justice i just hope that you know uh the the survivors of these crimes are able to get the resources and the help that they need to yeah. move forward cuz a lot of times i feel like we concentrate on R. kelly and how punitive these these uh these punishments are for the abusers but Oftentimes we don't even think about the people who are actually suffering from these crimes and what it is that's actually being done to make sure that their lives can go on in a meaningful and peaceful way and that they can get better. So I hope those people are getting the stuff that they need to get better from these crimes. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. And and you know we unfortunately we don't have much time, but there there are statements from many of the people who who testified and you know. We, it still remains to be seen what the the actual punishment ends up being, but the fact that it's acknowledged in this way after you know the earlier case a number of years ago um, has got a has got to feel great or as great as anything can, considering how disgusting this entire situation is. And it is it just like it's great to see developments on these things when when things have been brewing for a long time and you finally get a development. It's it's amazing like this. Or the, like earlier this year with with Britney Spears finally having Epstein, you know, like these things that have been known about for a long time, but the justice is so slow. It is just amazing to see like if you are rich and if you are well connected, it doesn't matter how pervasive, how well known your crimes are, how many victims there are. It'll take years at the very least, if not decades. But if you're a regular person, they'll shoot you on the spot. It's just amazing how like. There, you cannot exaggerate how important money is when it comes to our criminal justice system. Um, but at least it looks like in this case, they are moving in the right direction. That said, um, he's going to be sentenced at 10 a.m. May 4th. So uh, it's a long, long time from now, but faces up to te- uh, 10 years to life in prison. So May 4th, I mean, we're talking about the better part of a year from now, um, but at least it's moving in the, in the right direction. Uh, any further thoughts, Waz? Uh, not really, man. Like the, the, these things that he's accused of and been convicted of are so obviously <clears throat> horrific 
Like there's no debate here. There's no like, yeah. hmm, maybe people should be able to hang out with 14 year olds when they're 28. Like there's no way to argue the other side of it. This is just obviously horrible. Yeah. Hundred percent. And by the way, there are other court cases in multiple states: child pornography charges, obstruction charges, and all that. So more developments to come. That said, if you're on whatever linear platforms, thank you so much for watching to our first hour. If you're on Twitch and YouTube, though, we do have more news coming at you. So we're gonna take a short, actual break, but we'll be back with more news after this. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.